Grace and peace to you from God the Father, His Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have you received recently any notifications on your smartphone letting you know how much screen time you've had? Mine usually comes at 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings, just to remind me. My screen time has been kind of problematic since I was young. I was a certifiable TV junkie. I grew up in what I believe was the heyday of excellent television. One Saturday afternoon program that I enjoyed very much had this as their show opener. Spanning the globe to bring you the constant variety of sports, the thrill of victory, and the agony of defeat, the human drama of athletic competition. This is ABC's Wide World of Sports. Those words, edited with exciting sports footage, made the intro almost better than the program. But the program was still pretty exciting. Acapulco cliff diving, the agony of defeat ski jumping, they had that image of that guy just falling like a raggedy Ann, or the image of an exhausted long distance runner breaking the tape. It was very exciting to me. What mimics life better than sports? The ups and the downs, the heartache and the triumphs, the wins and the losses. March Madness is our annual overdose of college basketball. I prefer college hoops to just about any other sport on television. Forgive me, all of you football, baseball, track, and wrestlers. Competitive sports has you standing and cheering one moment The next, you might have your face in your hands, head down, heart broken. You praise a player at one end of the court, and then you curse an official at the other. Well, not with curse words, though. At the conclusion of the contest, fans and players either leave exhilarated with a win, or they leave disappointed in a loss. The thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. Many churches across the United States and around the world are observing the traditional Palm Sunday worship this morning. The triumphal entrance of Jesus as he made his way into Jerusalem, marking his last week of life on earth. Other churches, including the Roman Catholic Church and many mainline Protestant denominations, observe Passion Sunday, not Palm Sunday. Instead of focusing only on the excitement of the humble and heralded king entering the city, Passion Sunday covers the entire week leading up to Jesus being placed dead in a tomb. So why the rush to the tomb? I looked it up, and a couple of articles I read explain it this way. They contend that Palm Sunday... When Jesus is celebrated by cheering crowds, that might leave us with this feeling that everyone in Jerusalem was excited for this new king. And they were, for a moment. They fear we might be content with a king who is celebrated with cheers and gets the red carpet treatment in the form of palm branches being laid on the road. That kind of greeting would be for a war hero returning from a victory. I think it's safe to say there, there's also a caving to the culture happening here as well. Church attendance on Maundy Thursday and Good Friday ain't what it used to be. And maybe some church leaders want to make sure that the people in the pews are getting the full story about Jesus' last week of life on earth. And I guess that's a good thing. So that full story from Bethany to the tomb... Well, there's his entrance into Jerusalem, which I just read. His, there's this moment of anger in the temple courtyard as he turns over tables used for greed and profit rather than for sacrifice and worship. Included in that Passion Sunday narrative would be Jesus and his disciples sharing his last supper, his washing of their feet, and the early departure of the man who would betray him hours later with a kiss on the cheek and 30 pieces of silver in his satchel. 
Jesus would be betrayed in the darkness of the day and in the darkness of sin, the sin of Judas. The story would continue in the garden where Jesus would pray something like this, does it really need to happen this way, Father? And then his sleepy and denying disciples vanish as soon as Jesus is arrested. And then he is brought before Pilate and Herod in a court trial that was more theatrical than it was just and right. Justice had no part of that trial. The Savior of the world was treated without honor and without dignity by both Jew and Gentile. He was spit upon. He was whipped. He was beaten within an inch of his life, and then he became a dead man walking. He was to become an example of what happens when you preach peace over power. When you do that, you die, even if you're the Son of God. I've just given you a very condensed version of Passion Sunday. Every sermon that I've preached here at Zion better have ended with Jesus on the cross. Jesus in the grave, and then, most importantly, Jesus resurrected. If one of my sermons did not include that, then I have failed you, because if his tomb is not empty, if he didn't come back to life three days later to eat fish on the shore and walk through walls, we have wasted our religious lives. Jesus was aware of what the prophets had written about him. He knew scripture. He knew what we know as the Bible, the Old Testament. But he didn't follow that, that prophecy as a script. He followed it as the truth of God. As Zechariah prophesied 500 years, 500 years before Jesus, your king comes with righteousness and salvation. Well, the Jews liked that. They longed for victory, security, and freedom. We're not too far from that. Your king comes gently while riding on a donkey, riding on an animal used for the burden of work and life. Gentle and on a donkey. Not a majestic stallion a valiant war general would ride on as he enters the city, celebrating a resounding victory. No, this animal would appear small and unstable, carrying a peasant-looking man dressed in clothing befitting a servant, not a warrior. But that is who Zechariah is professing will rule all mankind, not by force, but by invitation. Prisoners of the powerful will be freed. Salvation will be available to all through the blood of a peasant. So we know who to look for. A peasant on a young beast of burden. And his journey would begin soon. The procession would start on foot in Bethany, a couple of miles outside of Jerusalem. But first, Jesus preps for the journey by resting and enjoying a meal and fellowship with his friends in Bethany. But the evening doesn't go without important lessons and a look into what would transpire in the next five or six days. Jesus' disciples and his friends Lazarus, Mary, and Martha were all there. It was their house. Then Mary takes a jar of perfume and pours it on Jesus' feet and then dries his feet with her hair. Judas, of course, was the first to speak up because he was only concerned about Judas. What a waste. We could have sold that and given the money to the poor. Oh, a very noble thought, but it was a devious one. G Jesus knew Judas's heart, that it was only interested in skimming off the top of the treasury. While the others may not have been aware of that, we can be certain that Jesus knew Judas's heart. And Jesus snaps at him. Leave her alone. This was intended for my burial, but she is honoring me by using it now. Crowds gathered 
because they heard Jesus was there. They wanted to see Jesus, but they also wanted to see the man he had raised from the dead, Lazarus. They knew he had been dead. He was in the, in the grave for four days. The chief priests did not like the fact that Jesus was creating such a following. So they wanted to kill Lazarus and end this charade being played out by this Galilean carpenter. The next day, the day we recognize as Palm Sunday, a crowd gathers in Jerusalem for the Passover festival because they heard Jesus was on his way from Bethany to Jerusalem. So the king found a young donkey, still a colt. He would mount it and process into the city, and everyone lived happily ever after. No. As he neared the end of that two-mile journey, they took palm branches, waved them, and laid them on the road, and they shouted the same words penned by the prophet Zechariah five centuries before. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the king of Israel. King? Who coronated Jesus king? Those words weren't only blaspheming God, they were downright disrespectful to Herod and the Roman authority. The parade appeared to be joy-filled, but that joy would be very short-lived. Some of the people who shouted, Hosanna, blessed be the king of Israel, later they would use those same voices to shout, crucify him. Just a few days later, love, admiration, and hope would turn to hate, condemnation, and murder. The king's entrance into Jerusalem became a greater irritant to the already irritated chief priests and Pharisees. See, they said, see this king and how the people congregate around him? This is getting us nowhere, they said. The thrill of victory is still a few days away for Jesus and for all who would follow him then and for us now, centuries later. The thrill of victory came in the unlikely form of a dead tree hewn into a life-ending cross. Before Jesus, no one ever thought of a cross as victorious, but it was. That cross gripped a king with the help of metal spikes, iron hammers, and the muscle and the dark hearts of his executioners and every sinner who cried, crucify him, and every sinner who didn't. Jesus made the journey to Jerusalem and to the cross for you. He withstood what we might consider to be the agony of defeat, but that is too pale a term to use for what Jesus went through. He fulfilled a centuries-old prophecy that was promised and documented so you could live forever with the king who entered Jerusalem. So you could live forever with the same king who walked out of a tomb alive. Experience the human drama of spiritual competition on the wide world of salvation. A real drama that gave us all victory over sin and death by the blood of our most valuable Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen.